Hey, hey, Steve once again coming to you from the Blue Cube. Um, back at it. This is the last um, lecture for Chapter 8. Uh, so we're going to be wrapping up Chapter 8 with this one. Um, once again, we're in this functionalist, structuralist kind of world, um, and we're moving towards the behaviorist world. And you're really going to feel that in, in this uh, lecture. We are really right on the cusp of behaviorism um, kind of becoming a big thing in America, but not quite there. Um, so in a way, this is positioned in the textbook as an example of, of the broad functionalist perspective that, that really embraced all sorts of methods and also all sorts of subject areas. So remember in Titchener's definition, the focus was really on the average adult human mind. Um, and so these other parts of the chapter are showing that eh, other people didn't really, they, they, they weren't happy being um, uh, constricted with that. So in this case, for example, comparative psychology is all about animal minds, learning about our own minds by learning more about some of our animal brethren and, and kind of getting a sense of what their cognitive worlds are like. You know, something Titchener would be like, but, um, but not the functionalists. The functionalists are, no, no, if we want to understand what the mind does, what it's for, um, then we can watch the different variants of the mind across different species and maybe we can learn a lot about our own mind because maybe a lot of it is the same, you know, as the kind of context. <clears throat> so in a way, it's also marking the much more heavy use of animal research. Originally, animal research was confined to physiology stuff, the things I talked about back in Descartes, where they were cutting animals open to kind of see how the physiology worked. Um, now, the functional anatomy, by the way, physiology. But now um, we're going to see animals used more in a, in a more general way uh, in psychology as almost a proxy to humans, as a way to conduct experiments that, that we wouldn't conduct on, on humans but are considered ethical by some if conducted on animals, current company excluded. Okay, let's jump in. I'm going to start here. Um, George John Romains, by the way, born in Canada. Yay, woo. Uh, but I actually did a lot of his work in Britain. Um, and, and I just sort of present him to kind of introduce this topic. And I love that he, he wrote this book in praise of Darwin and the evolution of a Darwinian believer. The evolution of a Darwinian believer. Interesting. More a Spence notion of evolution there, I think. But, um, you know, the, the, this, this was the time. So I like to put that because this is a time when a lot of researchers were really... Do they embrace Darwin and everything he said full on, uh, or do they not? And Romains eventually did, as suggested by this title. Um, and of course, a core part of the Darwinian view is the notion that humans and animals vary on a continuum, a, a bunch of continuum perhaps, but at least if we're talking about cognitive, you know, psychology kinds of stuff, they, uh, that it is a continuum, not some sort of qualitative difference. The human mind is not something completely unlike uh, other minds, uh, but rather is one variant of a number of variants of, of minds that are probably related to one another, that our mind probably evolved from another sort of mind. So if we, if we learn minds in general, if we study minds in general, we can learn about our own. Um, so, I mean, just in Romain's world, what is the kind of activities that may be regarded as in indicative of a mind? What if you were looking for a mind in somebody else? I certainly do not so regard the flowing of a river or the, flow or the blowing of the wind. He doesn't think that's any indication of mind. Why? First, because the objects are too remote in kind from my own organism to admit of drawing any reasonable analogy between them and it. So they're just too, they're, they don't seem anything like at me at all, and therefore I have trouble believing they are like me mentally. Um, but this might be more important. They afford no evidence of feeling or purpose. You know, they just blow with the wind. They're not trying to do anything. There's no sense of a goal when you're watching, even though there's movement, right, in the water and the wind. Um, there's no sense of mind behind the movement. In other words, two conditions require to be satisfied before we even begin to imagine that observable activities are indicative of a mind. First, the activities must be displayed by a living organism. Interesting, right? If a robot seems to act with intention, 
still does not have a mind by his by his view and secondly they must be of a kind to suggest the presence of the two elements which we recognize as distinctive characteristics of the mind uh, as such consciousness and choice so we think consciousness arises from mind um, and you know when he says choice many people would have said rationality um, evidence of rational choice so it's not just you know you put two kinds of food in front of uh, an animal and it eats one it chose but i mean that could that's not really rational we don't get the sense it weighed anything so when he says choice he means much more rational choice okay anyway so uh, what i like about this is is here's the notion of, of somebody who is now seeing you know, just going out looking for minds in other animals. Do they have minds? Do they have a consciousness? Uh, and so that's, you know, kind of gives you a really good sense of what comparative psychology is about. If they have a consciousness, how similar or different is it than ours? You know, those are all very interesting questions to somebody interested in comparative psychology. I'm going to hop here with uh, C. Lloyd Morgan because he's an interesting intermediary in here. He's talked about quickly in the in the textbook, but let me sort of jump back here. First of all, for people like Romains, he spoke a lot about minds and animals, and he gave a lot of anecdotal evidence. He would repeat stories he had heard about animals doing things that seemed to suggest they have a mind. Um, and by the way, I can't resist my favorite example of this. I, I ask you to YouTube... Um, Oh, shoot. San Diego Aquarium, I think, octopus, lobster. And if you find a story about lobster going missing, watch that video. Um, what it will ultimately suggest is that an octopus, which is an organism very different, very remote from a human organism, it's got no bones, for example, um, and yet it looks like this octopus steals and hides its evidence and does things that we think are associated with a mind. It seems to act intentionally. So check that out and think of this quote. But that is exactly the kind of thing Romains would focus on, these stories of animals who did really crazy and clever things. Um, and when we get now to Morgan, who was also interested in this issue of minds and, and other animals, he was very unhappy with Romains' approach. He, he just felt, yeah, we, we need to be more experimental. We, we need to be more specific. Um, yeah, you know, really more experimental. We need to collect data, not stories, so to speak, not anecdotes. Uh, so he really pushed that a lot. Um, and one of the other things he's associated with is a sort of example of that. Uh, but it really, as you see, kind of leads well into, into where we'll go with this next, uh, is he spent some time observing his dog, Tony. So this is a, apparently Tony up here. Tony lived in a garden where there was a gate, and there was this little latch to open the door of the gate. And L Lloyd apparently just watched Tony on occasions. I don't know. I guess he sat in the garden and wrote or something. And, and he know, knew that Tony wanted to leave the garden. And in fact, Tony eventually learned how to lift the gate and open the door and get out. But this happened gradually. And this is what Morgan kind of documented that in the original attempts, um, it was just what he called trial and error, that, that, that the dog just happened to be around the gate because he wanted to get out. Um, and because he was sticking his nose through and maybe sticking his head through to see out, maybe on some occasion, say the top of his head hit, um, lifted the latch enough for the gate to open and he got out and um, cool. But then the next time he was in there, it's not like he understood it yet. He would again muck around with it um, and eventually get lucky and eventually open the latch. But over time, it looked like the dog started to understand what was going on. And eventually he could go right up to the gate, lift the latch and, and open the door and get out. Um, so this sort of trial and error learning, uh, Morgan thought was very uh, interesting and important. So let's put that in our hat because when you meet Thorndike, you'll see he's taken this another level. Um, the, other, the last thing I want to emphasize about Morgan, and it is the challenge to every comparative psychologist, everybody who would like to say that animals have some human-like, say, consciousness or something like that, self-awareness. Um, and so then they want to show some evidence that suggests this animal does possess this high level cognitive ability. Well, for any evidence to be con uh, convincing, it has to satisfy what we now, now call Morgan's canon. Uh, a canon is a sort of a rule. Um, 
to guide how you do things. In this case, to guide how you interpret the results from comparative psychology. So his canon says this, in no case may we interpret any action as the outcome of an exercise of a higher psychical quality, uh, faculty if it can be fairly interpreted as the outcome of the exercise of one which stands lower on the psychological scale. So here's what he meant. Somebody could look at Tony after Tony had learned everything and think like, wow, Tony has this amazing ability. He wants to leave the garden. So he goes over and lifts the gate and opens the door and leaves the garden. Clearly, he is a, con a dog with high level cognitive abilities. But of course, what Morgan ultimately suggested is, no, he, he got there through simple trial and error, um, a, a simple trial and error process. Not because he sat down and thought about it and figured out, oh, here's how to, how to do this. But rather he was just trying to get out and things happened and he got out a few times and he kind of figured out the process. So, so he had figured something out over time. Um, but that is sort of a lower level learning process. And so he thought, well, I can explain Morgan as the outcome of some lower level process called learning rather than some higher level process of, of sort of conscious goal oriented behavior. Um, and so this is now the challenge to people, you know, people quite honestly like me, who who believe that animals have a richer mental life than we sometimes give them credit for, um, and who would like to find evidence for that. Um, to be convincing, any evidence you have to show has to kind of rule out more rudimentary explanations to satisfy Morgan's canon. Okay, so given everything I just told you about Morgan, you would think he would love the next person that we're going to talk about because Morgan wanted more experimental approaches, right? Um, and and he believed in um, wow this this canon and other things. So let me just let me just bring you into this, and we'll bring Morgan back later. So I'm going to put Morgan on the shelf for now, and I'm going to introduce you to Thorndike. Um, all right, there we are, Thorndike, Edward Thorndike. Um, such an interesting character. Uh, he is not your, your prototypical go on to become a major figure of science kind of person. Um, he went through so many, um, well, you, you'll get a lot of it in the textbook. It, it's, it's sort of a fun read. I mean, I gave you a taste of it here and, and I, and I put this in both to tell you a little bit about, uh, Thorndike himself, but also to give you a taste of the, the times, um, you know, that spirit of the times is a zeitgeist. Um, and to, you know, kind of show you how some of these characters interacted, um, kind of like we will do maybe in Pure Scholar 2. Um, so this is Thorndike speaking about him coming to Harvard, where William James um, was, was entrenched at the time. Um, and... Um, trying to figure out what he's going to do for his thesis. So I suggested experiments with the instinctive and intelligent behavior of chickens as a topic. Well, we've talked about intelligence was a big thing at the time. Instinctive, you know, sort of the genetic basis of intelligence. So, so this shouldn't all sound too off to you. This is the things that we've been talking about earlier in this chapter, in fact. Now, this is, so he wanted to look at chickens. Okay, so this is where it's kind of funny. He didn't have any lab space. He didn't have stuff to work with. So I kept these animals. And what, what he means by I kept these animals, he means in his rented apartment <laughs> and conducted the experiments in my room until the landlady's protest became imperative. So his landlady would not allow him to keep chickens in his room. <laughs> Sure. William James tried to get a few square feet required for me in the laboratory and then at the Agassiz Museum. So William James steps in and tries to get this guy some space for his chickens. Um, he was refused and with his habitual kindness and devotion to underdogs and eccentric aspects of science. So, so James liked underdogs and he liked weird science things. Uh, he harbored my chickens in the cellar of his own home for the rest of the year. <laughs> James took in the chickens. Um, the nuance to Mrs. James was, I hope, somewhat mitigated. Sorry, the nuisance was somewhat mitigated by the entertainment of the two youngest children. So the children liked the chickens um, quite a bit. Okay, this just gives you a weird flavor, you know, lest we think these people are like, oh, they're amazing. They're figures in the psychology textbook. This is some dude wrangling chickens from his landlady to his supervisor's house. So, you know, should you go to grad school and should things seem a little less glamorous than you expect? 
think of Thorndike. Okay, come back to Thorndike. Okay, so what did Thorndike do? Well, as almost as suggested by this, he didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of research grants to work with, um, but he was a very creative individual and he was kind of known as such. So let's start in the middle. What he did is create these little, well, they're called puzzle boxes, um, but basically he had a bunch of slats of wood laying around um, and, you know, pallets uh, that he could get for free. And so he basically took these pallets and he created these so-called puzzle boxes. And why they're called puzzle boxes is you would put a cat inside and there would be certain actions the cat would have to do to find how to escape from this puzzle box. And typically there'd be some food outside the puzzle box and when the cat's put in the puzzle box, they're, they're hungry. Uh, and so they're motivated, you know, uh, in, in any science context, if they describe an animal being motivated, what they usually mean is they, they um, usually starve them to 80% of their body weight their desired body weight, so they're very hungry, and then they put food somewhere um, to, to motivate them to get the food. So that's how we get motivation up. Good thing we don't do that in university, huh? Get you students motivated, starve you. <laughs> that's not even funny. I don't, I don't know why I'm laughing. Anyway, okay, so he built these puzzle boxes. And the idea is the cat, through the right thing, is maybe they'd have to flip their paw here, maybe they'd have to push against the door, maybe they'd have to pull some sort of tab, maybe they'd have to push something up there. There were things they would have to do that would get them out of a particular box. And what the what Thorndike noted and, and sh you know showed quantitatively is if you plotted a, a plot of how long it took them to get out, you would see a function like this. And so what do we mean by this? Um, the very first time, this is the very first time the animals put in this box, it takes them quite a while to figure out how to get out. So 150 seconds here, over two minutes to figure out how to get out of that box. Um, now the second time, this person, this, this cat happens to be real quick the second time, but then a little slow the third time, then a little quicker. But what you basically see is this function, whoops, sorry, this function of uh, a, a sort of you know declining exponential function as it were um, and the cat gets faster and faster and faster and escaping with experience it's figuring something out it's learning this is going to be important um, in, in, in a moment as I'll highlight um, well, let me highlight it now Thorndike really the focus of what he was doing was learning um, which became the focus of behaviorism uh, in, the, in the whole chapter that that you know, will come subsequently. So he was finding a very quantitative way to measure learning in terms of how long it took the cats to escape. Um, and he found evidence of it. They got quicker and quicker and quicker. So, um, you know, perhaps the first animal study of learning um, was done by Thorndike in the context of these puzzle boxes. Okay. Two real things I want you to take away from Thorn, uh, Thorndike. So the first is, he sort of began making everything feel very scientific again. Remember things like laws, like the law of gravity, Newton, this is Newton coming back again. So um, Thorndike coined the term, the law of effect, which he defined as follows. Actions that are followed by favorable consequences are more likely to be repeated than actions followed by unfavorable consequences. So what he was saying here with respect to the puzzle box, he was trying to describe what it was the cats had learned. And what he's suggesting here is the learning process worked as the following. The cat originally probably behaved randomly the very first time he was put in the puzzle box. But eventually, of course, he did something that got him out of that box, which was followed by favorable consequences. He got his food. So eventually the cat did that thing that got him out of the box, that was followed by favorable consequences, and therefore the next time the cat is in the box, that thing he did is more likely to be repeated um, than the actions that didn't lead to favorable consequences. So he was suggesting that that thing that leads to good consequences gets reinforced and therefore is more likely to happen, or said another way, will happen more quickly on subsequent exposures to the box. So whatever action got the cat out of the box, um, it becomes progressively more likely that, that he will do that action, which means it's, it's sooner that he actually gets around to trying that. And that's why he's getting out quicker and quicker. So that was his, um, his explanation. 
Uh, it's what we will be calling positive reinforcement, um, which is one part of a larger picture in the behavior story. Uh, but he was the one to kind of, you know, make that part clear and to call it the law of effect and get that oomph that comes from, from having a law of science. Okay. The other thing, and I've already let the cat out of the bag. Wow, that's a weird... Okay, anyway, um, is, is what I suggested to you early. And this is uh, Thorndike in his own words. Man's power to change himself. Sorry for the anthropomorphic kind of style here, but man's power to change himself, that is to learn, is perhaps the most impressive thing about him. Civilization is indeed the chief product of human learning. Homes and tools, language and art, customs and laws, science and religion are all created by changes in the minds of men. Their maintenance and use also depend on human modifiability, the ability of man to learn. If that were reduced by half, most of human civilization would be unusable by the next generation and would soon vanish off the face of the earth. He is focusing on the importance of understanding how we learn. Why is that important? Well, let me just make it clear to you. We've talked a lot throughout this course already about the power of the sort of nature side, Darwin, heredity, um, you know, all, all, all that kind of stuff that, that we've talked about right down to, you know, Galton um, and, and some of his sort of positions in that respect. So that was a very nature heavy focus of science and what we're seeing here is the emergence or re-emergence of the nurture and what do i mean by re-emergence well let's go back to the to the british empiricists right and and the tabla rasa lux tabla rasa um, that notion we're born a blank slate and then experiences right on that slate and make us who we are that view kind of got pushed back with darwin um, but now it's coming back to the fore uh, and and um, Thorndike really emphasizing that understanding how we learn, how critical our ability to learn and adapt is. And this might be the most important thing to understand about humans. And that's really going to set the stage for behaviorism to kind of jump in and, and take up that challenge. So the last thing I'm going to say in this part is I just want to bring it back to Morgan. Because it's kind of interesting. You'd think Morgan would like this. It's a very scientific attempt to understand the minds of animals, um, but he wasn't impressed. <laughs> he was. He was. Uh, this is his, his comments in one source. The conditions of his experiments, Thorndike's, were perhaps not the most conducive to the discovery of rationality in animals, if it exists. The sturdy and inconvincible advocate of reasoning, properly so called, um, in Reasoning in animals. So someone, sorry, what he's saying here is somebody who is really sure that animals reason may say that to place a starving kitten in a cramped confinement of one of Thorndike's box cages would be more likely to make a cat swear, swear than to lead it to act rationally. What he's saying here is that Thorndike's experiment, you know, he, he's kind of, one of, okay, let me give you this necessary part. Some people interpreted Thorndike's experiment as saying, hey, you know, almost back to Tony, this high level behavior of escaping um, is just a function of a very low level learning experience. Uh, but they also took it a step further and suggested that's all animals are capable of. And that's what Morgan's really annoyed by here. Um, people kind of throwing out just that just because Thorndike doesn't show evidence of high level cognitive thinking, um, animals don't have it. And Morgan is basically saying, hey, 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 yes, I agree that you can't assume high level cognitive behavior if you can provide a lower level description, but you also can't assume the animal is incapable of it if you put them in a situation where they're unlikely to show it if they got it. And so he's saying, even if this cat was capable of very deep rational thought, the conditions of the experiment would not be ones where it would rely on that. On that. It's hungry. It's Caught, stuck in a box it wants to get out and so you're you're essentially making it act in an, in an emotional way not in a rational way um, so i would like you to keep that in mind when we eventually talk about Kohler's work on insight with apes um, and, and we'll draw a slight distinction between what we're, what we've seen happening here with Thorndike and what we'll see with Kohler's okay that's it